Bali, the island they call the morning of the world. It's here my brother Lawrence and I have built our home. It's been a place to return to from all our travels. That's Lawrence, and I'm Lorne, the one wearing a skirt. We'd recently been reading about another island in an old book, the same one that had led us to Indonesia nine years before. The Malay Archipelago by Alfred Russell Wallace. Nine years of rough treatment on this too, and it's, this book is not quite what it was when it first lured us into Indonesia. It had been a constant companion on all our adventures since, even the hairiest ones. This time it was going to get us into some serious trouble, the most difficult and dangerous of all our Indonesian adventures. We were headed for one of the world's last untamed wildernesses, where Lawrence, would you believe, thought we might find a lost tribe. Borneo! Since earliest childhood, the very word has filled me with awe and fascination. But it's about the last place on Earth I actually expected to find myself in. But here we are now, seven days after we first began this ridiculous adventure, at the start of a search for the nomadic Punandayaks, who, we hope, may still be wandering way beyond these rapids, high in the unexplored interior. From the coastal authorities, we heard they no longer exist in their nomadic form. We heard stories of giant horned uh, river, river snakes and cannibals. But the only way we can find out is to get in there. And the only way to get in is during the rainy season, when the rivers are swollen enough to be able to get right the way up to their source. The rivers are Borneo's only highways. And Lawrence and I had managed to hitch a ride to the interior on the fastest boat on the river. What had so far taken a few days would have meant weeks on the ordinary riverboats. This was the Mahakam, which coils deep into Indonesian Borneo, the largest and least explored part of the island. Even the latest aviation charts confess that the squiggles on their white patches are mainly guesswork. And the only place to find the nomadic Punans was in the blankest of the blank spaces, far beyond the rivers of the headhunting tribes. Funeral canoes of those tribes used to float down this river with headless corpses and their valuables. Pirates would hang around the river mouths, pillaging them of their gold. Today, the booty is timber. At the highest timber camp on the river, we felt dwarfed by the machinery needed to bring the forest to its knees. The forest canopy shelters many species still unknown to science. As the canopy goes, they go with it, never to revive. Nobody here had a clue what lay beyond the rapids, where the nomads might roam. But this man was interested. Wiesma was not a timber man. He said he was the son of a Sumatran sultan, and he did pack a gun, unusual for a civilian in Indonesia. Do you like coffee with milk or not? I'm all right with it. He'd persuaded the timber company to take him upriver to the last tribal longhouse before the rapids and he invited us along. So next day, we found ourselves in a shallower river, dodging half-submerged logs and driven by a crazed speed fiend. Oh, 
Our propeller shaft had sheared clean off, and the nearest spare was 300 miles back on the coast. So it was on to the buses for us, and a chance for Lawrence to get into some serious research. Well, I'd already read what little there is about the Poonans. They're being driven further and further into the forest by people like our fellow passengers. Javanese, Sumatrans, Bouganese, working for the timber companies, pushing the frontier. The Poonans were beginning to seem as unreal as the characters in their comic books. It had been days without rain, and we began to worry. The river level was dropping. But not for long. We could keep nothing dry. And after a few days, fungus-like things were beginning to grow on us. But we'd needed that rain to get up as far as this. Kenya Dayak territory. These are both grave markers and warnings to outsiders, for the Kenya were ferocious headhunters. They're just one of the some 200 different tribes of Dayaks, as the peoples of Borneo are called. Virtually all of them, except for the Punans, hunted heads. The Kenya still live in their traditional longhouses, raised high above floodwaters and predators. It's home to about 80 families, each with their own compartments, which front onto the communal veranda. This man is the village's official guardian of tradition. He showed us his family album. This was his father, who led the last headhunting expedition over the border into Malaysian Borneo. He brought home two heads. They had a big party. But the colonial Dutch government caught him. Eight years in Banjamas in jail. Their headhunting raids, like most of their activities, were governed by omens from the forest bird gods. Chief amongst them was the hornbill, with its black and white feathers. It was a demanding religion. Seeing certain birds at certain times were taken as omens which had to be immediately obeyed. He said the old religion was too difficult, too many birds. They couldn't go anywhere without being stopped by them. Now they believe in Jesus, he says. They can travel where and when they please. The Kenya were amongst the fiercest and most sophisticated of Borneo's headhunters. But they've been the first to succumb to change, brought up the very rivers they had once ruled. But it's here we met Lear, our first pure-blooded member of the Punan tribe. His distant ancestors had withdrawn from the headhunters' rivers to become the masters of the inner forest. He'd spent most of his life on the fringe of civilization and wasn't sure whether his nomadic cousins still existed. If anyone knew, it was Boreo, he said, an old Punan rhinoceros hunter who lived beyond the hills in another river system. 
Our chart didn't seem to know anything about that river. Leah and his Punan relatives could guide us into him for a small fee, but it would take at least a week. We got to ride the first stretch on the village policeman's powerboat, thanks to the ever-persuasive Wisma, who was determined to join forces with us. rapids meant the end of the line. That was the last powerboat we'd see in a very long time. A surprise package was Leah's nine-year-old nephew, Mabao, who would eat and play us off our feet through what would be months ahead. My homemade butterfly net and our aerosol freeze can are put to the test. It's supposed to chill the bugs long enough to film them. It sometimes works. <laughs> but this is a Raja Brook birdwing, first captured and named by Alfred Russell Wallace, who described having nearly passed out with excitement when he actually saw it in his net. How's it going, Wiz? Fine. Our guides insisted on going barefoot for balance and grip. They each carried an average of 80 pounds on their backs, twice the international airline allowance. We carried virtually nothing and still had a hell of a time keeping up with them. It took most of the day to reach the top of the ridge. The river we'd just left lay close beneath us. While on the other side, the forest seemed to stretch forever. The Punans don't just pitch camp, they build themselves a house. One kind of tree is used for the framework and another for the raised floor platform. And yet a third for the floor itself. It's only felled for its bark. The top makes a spongy mattress. The underneath, a sticky insect repellent. It seemed rather wasteful to us, but Leah said that Poonan law permits the use of all but the tallest trees for they are the guardians of the forest, the protectors of all life. If Wismar hadn't liberated some plastic sheeting from the timber company, they'd have thatched it with special leaves. It took them about half an hour to build. Every night we'd make one of these and abandon it next morning. We would swing alongside in our Mexican hammocks, the world's most comfortable beds. I felt sure we had a good chance of finding the nomads, but Lorne wasn't at all convinced. No, not for a minute. But I really didn't mind anymore. I felt that in a way we'd already found them, in our companions. Next day, we set out to the Symphony of Gibbons, the high wire artists of Inner Borneo. Our guides, who were all of Poonan descent, now seemed entirely in their element. We couldn't have been in better hands.
Six days later, we reached the river of the old rhino hunter. We'd made good time, about four miles a day, but at a cost. <laughs> Asun had had a bad fall, and there were many lesser wounds. At this rate, our precious duct tape wouldn't last long. There were canoes here, common property left by the last travelers to set out overland, but not a paddle between them. No problem for our Punan guides. This means of travel is not as relaxing as I'd expected. The slightest careless move in these delicately balanced canoes could have us all in the water. A few hours from the rhino hunter's longhouse, we agreed that Wiesmar's canoe should pull ahead to warn him of the odd strangers who were about to descend on him. Mini, the chief of the Velix. Wisma had had time to organize a formal greeting ceremony, a rather embarrassing inspection of the rats. But half of them were our own guides, who had turned the occasion into an elaborate joke on us. Asun, with kettle spout nose and painted beard, was doing his snappy impersonation of the wild man of Britain. We wanted wild punans. They had show us wild punans. An anthropologist's nightmare. <laughs> but the man we'd come to see was Berer, the rhinoceros hunter. He told us he'd killed about 55 rhinos. He eats the meat and can sell the horns down river as aphrodisiacs. It's illegal, of course. But this is the old hunt, following one rhino for three months and killing it with a spear. Kid decided to face the interview wearing his official headman's uniform. But Wiesmar, it turned out, was more impressed by what he had to say about gold-bearing rivers. We wanted to know about Boreo's nomadic cousins. He hadn't seen them in many years, but they just might be found at this season, about 25 days away. But it was a long and a hard journey. And he wondered if we had any idea what we were in for. When we asked if he would guide us in, he was hesitant. But intrigued by the idea of seeing them again. Then he said he'd not only take us, but he'd contribute all the food. Rice. The dry mountain rice that Boreo had only started growing about ten years before when he made the change from pure nomad to agricultural settler. I was surprised to see our guides helping. They'd agreed only to bring us this far, but now they seemed caught by the adventure too, and offered to stick with us for nothing, so long as the rice held out. Ho 
rolling upstream all day, every day, calls not only for stamina, but an extraordinary sense of shared balance. The idea is to hug the bank as closely as possible. The current's weaker here, and more important to me, there's a better chance of making it ashore if we turn over. The greatest danger is at the river bends, where we must cross over without getting broadsided by the current. By now we've made it higher up the Rio's river than any outsider before us. We were in unexplored territory. In places, the current became too fierce even for the most heroic polling. My camera gave me a great excuse for staying put, but Lawrence tried to be more helpful. I felt like such a colonialist just sitting there waiting for a dunking, but whenever I tried to help, I was ordered back in. The river became more and more shallow until finally we could follow it no further. our canoes above the high water mark for others who might need them perhaps even ourselves and following Boreo we set out on a much deeper journey there were 22 of us now carrying about three quarters of a ton half of it was the rice needed to feed us all the hunters carried their blowpipes and I had my trusty butterfly net this was a real expedition, like the storybooks, except that we certainly weren't in charge and didn't really understand where Boreo was leading us. It's not a silent forest. It's about as deafening as a city at rush hour. But what to us is a single wall of sound to the Poonans is distinguishable for all its individual musicians. <coughs> Creatures which to us are almost invisible. natural death of a great tree. It's surprising how often we hear this. What we had expected were the insects. Some people say they're the main reason why Borneo's remained so unexplored by outsiders. We were getting a few nasty stings every day now. And these tiny bees have a particularly vicious one. But they're only after the salt in our sweat. And we must move very gently to avoid their anger. We got a real scare on the trail, though, when Lorne was stung on the back of the neck. At first I thought I'd been struck by a tree snake. But it was just one of those tiny bees. I was completely blinded for almost an hour. And from then on, I was haunted by the fear of its happening again, of being blind in the heart of Borneo.
and then there were the leeches. They'd tightrope down our hammock cords or get us on the trail. They're drawn to our body heat, finding the least sensitive points. Boreo said it's best to let them suck their fill, then they come off easily. We'd never have recognized this as quagmire. The only safe way across was over felled saplings that were sinking beneath our weight. Our greatest fear was of breaking a leg. A serious matter here. This isn't stretcher-bearing country. But it wasn't the danger that was getting me. It was the endless, exhausting drudgery. Day after day of it. Pitching camp at nightfall and rising at dawn to struggle hungry through another day. And we hadn't a clue where we were. We clung desperately to our chart, trying to impose some sort of order on our wild surroundings. Then everything changed. That was the day Boreo led us up to a high promontory. A waterfall, well over a thousand feet high where there are supposed to be no rivers. Or the other one that's round the corner from there. You see there are two of them. There's no indication of that on the chart either. And that must be another river to produce so much water. Boreo told me he'd never been there. His ancestors had long ago. He reckoned they were only about two days off course. He could take us there. But instead of trying to fix them on our map, I was surprised to find that Lorne and I were quite content to leave the honor of naming these falls to some later traveler. Something had happened to us. We no longer felt like struggling explorers. We could discard our useless chart and wander freely in the blank spaces beyond the known world. We roamed in the wake of the old forest wizard, Boreo, like children in their first garden. Even though he hadn't passed this way in 20 years, he seemed to know exactly where he was going. The secret, he told us, is that the Punans know they have two souls. The physical spark of life and the dream wanderer. In trance and sleep, the dream wanderer can travel beyond the body, he said. See with different eyes. The way to scattered members of their tribe. The whole atmosphere had changed. They paused at whiskey-colored rivers. They said their waters were a special tonic. <laughs> Leah's crowd had agreed to bear with us only until the rice ran out. But this quest for their last wild cousins now seemed to have gripped them as much as it had us. As our rice dwindled, they gathered roots and bitter-tasting ferns and pointed out more food up in the trees above us. Gibbons, blow-darted by the experts. They know which poisons to put on their darts for which animals. But cooking monkey is tricky. You can only bake him on the fire. If you fry or boil him, the poison can kill you. I pestered Hijau to take us on a hunt. 
that he said we were far too clumsy and noisy. After three or four years of practice, maybe. First, we'd have to learn how to move like the forest. Become part of the forest dance like all the other animals. By now, gibbons were our only source of protein. We were hungry. After more than a month of no other signs of human life, suddenly our first contact, a fresh message stick. Poonans have passed this way within the last few days. Six stripped notches means six people, Lear explains. All the Punans understand these sticks. This leaf means they're hungry too, eating more greenery than game. And one moon shape shows they've been traveling for a month. But our rising spirits are quickly checked. Far too dangerous to wade across and too wide to fell a tree over. Swollen by a storm in the highlands, he says. Maybe coming this way. And he was right. Five relentless days of it. Then a science fiction sun appeared. But it would still be days before the river subsided. With the sun came the insects again, as ravenous as we were. There were no more gibbons around now, and we finished the last of our rice. I was feeling distinctly insecure at this point, but they didn't seem at all bothered. You see, they hadn't told us that during the rainstorm, Boreo had had one of his dreams. He had seen the nomads sheltering in some long-abandoned longhouses further down this river. So that morning, he'd sent a scouting party overland to investigate. I'd reconciled myself to never finding the Poonans by now, but our companions seemed to have complete confidence in Boreo's dream. They groomed themselves optimistically for the famed forest maidens who might lie ahead. <laughs> After several days, the river had subsided and our scouting party reappeared with canoes. The longhouses were there and so too, for the moment, were nomadic punans. didn't doubt at all that the wild Poonans would still be there when we arrived. 
I wondered what they'd make of Wismar and us. If they hung around to find out. So these were the Poonams of the inner forest. They were nervous at first, fearing we might be agents sent to track them down and domesticate them. Over the last five years, some had settled more or less permanently into these longhouses, built and abandoned by another tribe long since gone. But many of them still wander freely in the forest and were just passing through. They had traded with other tribes for their modern clothes. But they wore them with heirlooms inherited through hundreds of generations. Chinese and Indian and Arabian beads and valuable antique coins from the nations which once warred for the spice trade. Their earlobes are stretched from childhood by gradually adding more earrings. It's not the rings, but the long ears which are the objects of beauty. All our guides were taken in like one of their own. Our best clothes got their first proper laundering for the big bash that night. For the dance of the hornbill, everyone must take their turn at dancing solo before passing the feathers on to the next person of their choice. Controlled movements are supposed to reflect the dancer's skill at balancing within him the upper world of the dream wanderer and the lower world of matter. It's a chance to sum up each other's character at the cost of submitting to scrutiny oneself. Even Lorne was weeded out from behind his camera to perform an inspired rendition of a large bird of some sort. It was an opportunity to make a total idiot of myself. Kijal, <laughs> the hunter, did somewhat better than me. I think the journey back to his cultural roots had become as much an adventure for him as it was for us. And he celebrated with his first ritual tattoo. As did nearly all our guides and bearers. Every major event in a Poonan's life, whether an outer adventure or an inner dream, is ritualized with a tattoo. This way he carries his entire life experience engraved on his body. After a week of almost non-stop partying, our companions had to return to their rice fields and families. We weren't 
nearly ready to leave this magical world Boreo had guided us into. And he assured us that his forest cousins could lead us out when the time came. The tender farewells confirmed my suspicions. But not all their evenings in the longhouse had been spent dancing the dance of the hornbill. Wisma, who hadn't found whatever it was he was after, went with them. Our last link with the outside world gone, we were left alone with the forest punans. Perhaps without Wismar around, our presence would now seem less official. The elders began telling us that many of them shelter in these longhouses only during the heaviest rains, before returning to follow the jungle tides of wild game. Then one of their more sophisticated relatives appointed himself as our interpreter. He seemed to be warning them about careless talk with strangers. He insists they're saying that their old ways, just wandering in the forest, hunting and gathering, were evil. Now they plant bananas and yams. That's good. Lawrence wasn't getting very far with his religious research either. There's only one God, the interpreter says. Jesus and no other. I realized the interpreter was only trying to protect them. He'd seen enough of the outside world to know that the truth can be dangerous. We'd been in too big a hurry. Memories of the outside world seemed like fleeting images from a previous incarnation. Every morning we were awakened to the rhythms of their water music. It became clear that these people devote much more of their time to hunting than pursuing the arts of agriculture. And they would bring us bizarre gifts of food from the forest. Their hunting dogs are valued almost as highly as their children. And they never go short of love. These wandering nomads own little and share everything. They found the whole idea of private property pretty silly. What they do own must be easy to carry like the woven rattan mats and baskets, so prized by all the other Dayak tribes of Borneo. They trade them for clothes, but they'd never part with the family baby carrier. Encrusted with ancient beads and bear's claws and crocodile's teeth, they're magical shields against both physical and psychic harm. 
But the meaning of the central symbol still eluded us. We saw it everywhere, in many forms. They called it upping, but would tell us no more. We had found a community of such strength and tenderness that it dawned on me that these were indeed a people who were still familiar with the mysteries which we'd been searching for through all our years in Indonesia. Like our porters before us, we wanted to celebrate the discovery. How's it feeling? Feels like a bunch of beast things, one after the other. A couple of sweet old ladies pounded a die of charred roots into us with rusty nails for three hours. And then they started all over again. When I stood up the first time, I thought that a slab of flesh was going to fall out in the same shape as the drawing. <laughs> it was they who chose the designs, not us. And they explained to Lawrence what they meant. They told me they were symbols of Aping, whose many faces we'd been seeing all around us. The supreme Punan god, the tree of all life. I'd become very close to Gadget and his wife Mera, and they now told me why they'd been so hesitant to talk about Aping. They'd recently been reached by missionary converts from a former headhunting tribe who had told them that Aping was an evil spirit. But those who believed in him would burn forever in the fires of hell as all their ancestors were now doing. The missionaries had also insisted that the president of Indonesia was a Christian and that it was against the law not to be one. I pointed out that the president was actually a Muslim and that if they were wrong about that, then their facts about hell fire mightn't be too reliable either. <laughs> Anyway, they decided to stick with the old religion. And if we wanted to know more, we should visit Nyanyet, who sometimes lived downriver at the foot of Spirit Mountain. Nanyet is possibly the last priest of the old religion. He spends most of his time alone in the forest, but returns to become both the community's doctor and philosopher. He knows all the medicinal plants of the forest, and he can direct a healing energy through his hands. He said we all have a dream wanderer, though most of us live our lives amongst the roots of the world. Our dream wanderer can learn to move through the upper branches of the tree of all life, the body of Apen. Sometimes, he said, the tree speaks through him, and tonight, if we wished, we could listen. Almost nothing is known or written about the Punan religion, and on the verge of its disappearance from the world, we were in the extraordinary position of being able to capture a moment of it. It is a special language which comes from the inside while in trance. They call it the language of before being born and of after dying.
There we were, stumbling over our cables, struggling with failing batteries, blinding them with our lights. And it was only afterwards that Nanyet told us the entire thing had been just for our benefit, to awaken our dream wanderers. He predicted that within a few days, one or other of us would have a special dream. I didn't have a dream, but I remember. But Lorn certainly did, and he wouldn't shut up about it. It's true. I dreamt I was in a massive tree that stretched from coast to coast of Borneo. One tree. In it, all around me were creatures I should have been afraid of. And others that should have been afraid of me. But I saw myself in each of them. And all of them were parts of me. For me, the whole thing had been a dream. Finding them, becoming part of them, and now leaving them again in their secret place. The way out would be long and treacherous. But I felt that everything would be all right now, as if we were covered in some way. Nanyet had told us that from now on, wherever we might get to amongst the tribes of man, we bore the symbol of Aping as a reminder of the one tree. A short walk from our home in Bali, there's a monkey temple. It's in the forest where there's a sacred banyan tree, which the Balinese say links heaven and earth, and where sometimes the angels can be seen coming down to bathe in its pools. After Borneo, their dance had a new meaning for me and so did the trees.